so my name is Andrew, um, and I'm talking today about PyNet, which was a project that never was really meant to be. So this is kind of a bit of a story, so we'll go with that anyway. Um, so my name is Andrew, I'm a final year student here. Um, if Bel Belfast wasn't on today, I would be sitting in here right now. Um, I'll not comment on if I would have been bored or not, but I would be sitting in here anyway. Um, and I'm assuming everyone has seen one of these before, yeah? We all kind of know what this is, yeah? A little Raspberry Pi, we've all kind of seen one of those. Um, I know that there's someone, someone in the audience somewhere is budding to tell me, Andrew, why on earth have you used such an ancient photo of a pie? That's not what a pie looks like now. That was billions of years ago. Um, I know you all want to like, you know, get excited about this new pie that apparently was just launched the other day. Very <laughs> exciting. Uh, but my story starts with that pie. So that was a few years ago. Um, back, um, back in 2012, that launched. Um, and if we start our story with a beautiful piece of artwork that my friend drew for a talk ages ago, that's apparently meant to be me. Do we see any sort of resemblance? Um, it was a while ago that's moved my diary out of school uniform on, um, back when I was in lower sixth, at the end of lower sixth, um, and I had seven tiny people. Now, they weren't that tiny. I know they look a little tiny in that. Um, they were primary seven kids, and don't worry, I wasn't actually teaching them binary. I wasn't that horrible of a teacher to primary seven kids. Um, but I was doing a project. I'd cobbled together a bunch of Raspberry Pis, pretty cool, tiny little computers, $35-ish, um, and it was the end of the school year. I had finished my exams, um, and I was working with the primary school that was connected to our secondary school with seven P7s teaching them coding, because why not? Um, and I had cobbled together these seven Raspberry Pis, and it was a two-day long workshop, and it was going great. We came to kind of the end of the first day, an hour or two maybe left to go, and I discovered I'd made a small, minor, tiny mistake um, with the uh, teaching. I was going to teach them, I think it was Sonic Pi I was going to use, this awesome piece of software for making music with code, until I realized I forgot to install it on all the Raspberry Pis. And obviously, being a school in Northern Ireland, I had no way to actually get internet on all these Raspberry Pis. So I kind of waffled a bit and uh, you know, told them all these great things about coding, and then the day finished, and that was fine. I could take all the Pis home, and that's what I did. I took all the Pis, all their SD cards home, and I went at home and I installed Sonic Pi on every single Raspberry Pi, on every single SD card. I'm lazy, so that kind of bugged me a bit. But then I came in the next morning, and I brought in these seven SD cards, and then realized, oh, I don't know which kid had which SD card. <laughs> so we proceeded to spend the next 30 minutes with the kids arguing about whose piece of work was on whose card, and they figured out eventually whose card it was. But why did, that was a pretty horrible experience. I only had seven kids. Like, what if you were a real teacher, not me, a fake teacher, what if you were a real teacher and you had more than seven pies? You had 20 pies, 30 pies. You had 30 students. You maybe had 100, 100 students, you maybe had 1,000 students in your school. That process kind of becomes a little bit more difficult um, when you have to take home an SD card for every single child in the school and install a piece of software. That's a little bit of a painful process. The hilarious bit is I do know some teachers who did previously do that. <laughs> um, don't worry, they didn't have a 1,000 kids in the school. But um, at the same time, I was working with a project called LTSP, the Linux Terminal Server Project. Anyone heard of it? Hands up. OK, a few. Um, and the Linux Terminal Server Project was all about taking um, kind of desktop machines. And it was built by the Greeks for their school system. Um, and they ran Ubuntu in their school system. And it was for taking all these desktop machines and basically network booting them. So the hard disk locally doesn't get used anymore. And the operating system gets pulled in off the network every single time it boots up, which means you maintain a nice, single, perfect one operating system. Um, and then the kids can log in on any machine. That's a really nice system, really nice idea. And it's all open source, funny enough. That's convenient. Um, and so I thought, wait, how hard could that be? I could just like, you know, fiddle with a little bit, a little bit here and there. And I'll just make that work for a pie. How hard could that be? <laughs> that, was, that was a bad idea. Um, because a couple of months later, I fiddled about, and I, at the time, remember, I'm just going into upper sixth at this point. So um, 
I'm kind of new to all this kind of coding stuff still at this point, but I heard about this thing called like GitHub. I know, right? Like really, you know, high end there. I'd heard about that and I thought I would try that out. And so I'd written some code to kind of hack together this to work with a Pi. And I thought, I'll put it on GitHub. That's a really great idea. And it was, because it was a great place to store code and it meant that I didn't lose the code and when my machine decided to kill its hard drive later, I had all my code there. But I then had an A-level to do. I was doing A-level computing, or uh, what's now called A-level computer science. And I needed to come up with a project for my final year. And I thought, hey, I could, I could kind of expand on this. You know, there's maybe 200 lines of code here. I could kind of you know, expand that, make it into a real project. Um, and I continued to do that throughout the year and put it on GitHub as I went. Um, and by the end of the year, I had a beautiful 200-page document which had far more text in it than actual code was written in the end, because that's how you do projects. You write about them. But I built this thing with a teacher over in England. His name was Ben. Um, and by the end of the year, I had this kind of list of things. I had network booting pies, really great. So one operating system maintained. So if you want to install a piece of software, you install it on the server, and then it goes out to all the pies. Um, I had login, so you could log into any pie. Um, and I had share folders because that's what Ben wanted. He wanted the ability to kind of have a shared folder that he shared between all the kids. Um, but then I kind of discovered, I made a little mistake. I worked with an educator, Ben. That, that, that was a little mistake because, um, oh, oh, I forgot that, not a mid dollar. Um, because I then got this email from this uh, guy. He's like, hi, Andrew. Um, I work out, blah, blah, blah. I was, I was recently chatting to Ben, um, and he was showing me your Raspberry Pi LTSP software that you've been working on. He showed me a link to the software on GitHub and gave me your user guide, your draft user guide you'd written for your project. Um, and uh, I, I've gone and set it up at my school. <laughs> I, this thing that I built for my A-level was kind of just meant to be for my A-level. And that was that. And Ben would use it over in England. And that was that. That was the plan. It was never meant to be used by anyone else. But I made the mistake of apparently it was a great idea to put it on GitHub. Um, and then at the bottom, I had a really quick query. Is there any way I can batch import users because I have a few hundred students? Ben was using it with one class of 30 kids, not a few hundred students. Um, and this guy was actually going through one at a time and adding each user one at a time, and it was taking them a while. Um, <laughs> so already, I've somehow ended up with, it turns out teachers talk to each other, by the way. That's how this guy kind of heard about this. They go and see each other's schools, and they have wee chats over cups of tea and coffee and eating biscuits. And they talk about it, and some of this teacher had come along to Ben's school and seen it. Um, but then it turns out, actually, that it kind of ballooned from there. And those two, two teachers kind of told a few more teachers, and told a few more teachers, and told a few more teachers, and told a few more teachers. So I thought, well, you know what? I'll put my user guide up on the internet so that everyone can use it. And then I can go back to like you know doing these A-level things I'm meant to be doing, uh, and these like exam things I'm meant to be doing. Um, so I built a, a, a stupidly ugly website. HTML is not really my thing. Um, sorry, more CSS is not really my thing. But stupidly ugly website, put it up there, great, done. I can go back to like, you know, doing other stuff. Um, I was about to start uni here, and uh, that was great, done. And then I started getting random tweets from people. And they're like, I set this up. And then more tweets, I set this up. And then this one is one of my favorite. We're a prison in Uganda. We've set this up. <laughs> and I, I will actually say this wasn't actually the prison in Uganda. It was a charity that went out and worked with prisons in Uganda. And they set it up. And the prisoners maintained the system because it was built to be easy. Because Ben wasn't the most techie in the world. And so I had to make it stupidly simple. Um, you know, Linux wasn't really his thing. So had to make it stupidly simple. And then the Raspberry Pi Foundation picked it up. <laughs> that was a bad idea. Um, they get a lot of people that see their blog. <laughs> um, a lot of people. And so they kind of asked for a bit of a write-up when I kind of threw them together a little thing and never really expected it to go anywhere. And then out of the blue, they put it on their front page blog and then tweeted all about it and the whole internet decided to hear about it. And then they wrote an article in their magazine about it. Paper, like it actually goes out in physical magazines to people. Um, and then I start getting memes about it. Like, you know, I guess that's kind of the sign that, you know, you built something cool, so when someone writes a meme about it, I don't know. Um, and then I got this one. This was really great. Um, not just using the classroom, but here on board, RV, Ramon, Blag, I'm not even going to try that. Fish sampling. 
Now, what is RV, whatever however you pronounce it? It's that. That's a boat in the Mediterranean. Yeah. It's an actual boat in the Mediterranean Sea that does research for a Spanish university. That's kind of cool, right? That was an A-level project, and it kind of by mistake did that. So I thought, well, you know, I'm bored at Queen's doing my degree. It's great and all that. Um, sorry, John. Um, <laughs> doing all that, you know, not really getting challenged the most in first year. It's first year, you know. Um, so I thought, hey, I'll make a nicer website. Ta-da. Slightly nicer, yeah. Nice picture, a friend of mine drew that. Nice logo. That took so long to find someone to make a nice logo. I'm not artistic, so I actually got people to help me with this that actually had, you know, graphics design sort of bones in their body, unlike me. Um, and so on to today, that was a number of years ago. The project is now five or six years old. Um, as of two years ago, uh, when it installed, there was an option for user, users that you could enable um, uh, basically a ping home that says, I exist. So I could kind of generally roughly count the Pinet servers that were connected to the internet. Um, and so that's kind of today. There's a few of them across the world. Um, what's kind of cool about this that I really love is educators and people who are setting this up are given the option that you can pick what you are. Are you a school? Are you a commercial organization? Are you a non-commercial organization? Or are you, I don't want to tell you because it's secret. Or I just don't want to tell you. That's perfectly fine too. Um, the green ones there are schools, kind of hard to see. The red ones are, are commercial organizations and the blue ones are non-commercial organizations. Um, and if we kind of zoom in a bit, there's a whole pile of them here um, for some odd reason. Who knows why? But a whole pile of people apparently want to run pies and network them together. Um, so some wacky ones. Obviously, there's a lot of schools there. The black ones, as I said, are ones that they just didn't tell me what they were, so I don't know. Um, there's an ambulance station somewhere in England that uses it. By the way, these are rough guesstimates. If they don't put a location, I roughly guess with their IP address. So um, you know, it, it amazes me that there's not some randomly in the sea or somewhere like that. Um, but so these aren't the most accurate in the world. But I've had I've had an ambulance station. I've had another boat, <laughs> because why not? Um, I've had what else have I had? Um, I've had a lot of charities. Um, I've had a, a, a number of them that are in Africa, um, doing kind of cheap computing out there. Um, and then I always like to say, I'll come on to that in a minute. There's us, the Northern Raspberry Jam. Um, so what's next for this amazing open source project that really was never meant to be? Um, Raspbian Stretch, so folks that know Raspberry Pis, um, there's, and Debian, there's operating system versions, kind of like you know Windows and all that stuff. Um, I'm working right now on the new Raspbian Stretch version. Um, support for the um, Pi 3B+, which was released two days ago, that's now done. I wrote, these the other, I wrote these the other day, and that was finished last night um, while I was getting ready to keel over and be sick, apparently. Um, LDAP user support, so uh, proper distributed users um, system. Uh, localization, that's been a really big one. It's now used, as you kind of saw, it's now used apparently across the world, but it's only available in English. So it's a really big project. It's hard, but is to try and get localization of a number of folks that have offer, offered to translate it. Um, more docs. That's always a good thing, apparently, um, and more videos. So um, throughout the whole process of this, I built this that nice little website thing with like 40 or 50 pages of docs. Um, turns out, if you write documentation for people, people will actually use it more because they actually understand what you've written. You don't seem very surprised about that. Um, and a super secret project that John knows more about that I'm not going to talk about today because it's not ready yet. Um, you can keep an eye on Pinet for that, but it's exciting, right? Yeah, okay, John says it's exciting. I should, by the way, clarify, John's my supervisor for my final year project. So um, anyway, rough takeaways. Um, obviously, these are all things that you should take on board. Don't build software and open source it. It's a really bad idea. Um, don't write good documentation or lots of documentation, because then people will actually use it. Um, and don't work with educators. They talk to you know, or just, or just do all the above. I find it really interesting anyway. Um, so anyway, thank you for listening. Um, although actually I should probably point out one final important bit. Um, the little plug, very important to plug obviously. Um, the other project I do, other than you know, write software for schools across the world apparently, um, is a thing called the Northern Ireland Raspberry Jam. Anyone in here heard of the Northern Ireland Raspberry Jam? 
There we go, okay. Um, can you tell, by the way, I work with kids a lot, so you know, that, hence the put your hands up in the air sort of thing. Um, don't worry, I won't get you to do hands on heads. We do that with the kids all the time. Um, they're free um, and family friendly events that we run just down the road there um, uh, at Queen's here in the um, as a physics teaching center down by the library. Um, we make stuff. Stuff. We don't, we don't kind of like to define what that is, but we do crazy stuff with electronics and software and hardware and, uh, you know, things like, great one we were doing recently, attach a resistor to the side of a balloon. If you pass loads of current through a resistor, it gets really hot. What do you think happens to the balloon when you try and melt the side of it? Which the kids really love and then they attach to like Twitter so that when you tweet at it, the balloon pops. Or the best one I really loved, um, you attach a camera to the pie, so you're kind of watching the area in front of the balloon. Then you put a motion sensor in front of it so that when someone walks past, the balloon explodes. And then you take a picture of them and you tweet it. <laughs> that wasn't my idea, by the way. That was one of the kids. He wanted to do that. Um, he then proceeded to tell me he wanted to put it in his room so that if his sister ever came into his room, it would scare her and tweet a picture of it. Who knows? Um, they're generally on the second Saturday of the month. Um, if they're not always, we sometimes move the dates around. All the details are on the internets, um, and you can go and uh, grab any details from there. Um, we, we are primarily for young people, but adults are more than welcome. We have an 85-year-old that frequently comes um, who is fantastic. He's great. Um, so it's not just kids. Obviously, there's lots of kids in pictures and stuff there because it's mainly kids we have, but adults are more than welcome. And if, obviously, you have kids or nieces or nephews or kids somehow, um, that are somewhere in your life, you can drag them along and teach them all, or bring them along to our cool events where we teach all these wacky, crazy things like, you know, exploding balloons and tweeting over them. Um, so do feel free, by the way. Um, we are very popular, though. So um, if you want to come, you do have to grab a ticket on the internet. And um, we get about 140 tickets each month sort of thing nowadays. Um, anyway, I'll go back to that now. Any questions? Yes. Yes. So on the PyNet website, uh, that's a good question. On the PyNet, so the question was, um, how do you help localize PyNet? On the website, uh, there is in the um, support section bit, um, there's a bit how to get involved basically, and there's a link there to sign up to the mailing list specifically for people who would like to help with localization. So there's a specific one that people, folks that maybe aren't developers, would love to help with localization. Um, I speak English and that's about it, so I'm pretty dire at it. But if there's anybody else that would like to help, I would love your help and, he, and um, that's the best way to do it, is sign up for the mail and specifically for localization um, on the site. Any other questions? No? Great, perfect. <laughs>